Presented by Caltech. Good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce the speaker for tonight's Ernest Watson Lecture, Professor Frederick Eberhardt. Professor Eberhardt received a bachelor's degree from the London School of Economics in Philosophy and Mathematics in 2002 and a PhD in Philosophy from Carnegie Mellon University. He joined the faculty in 2013 after a postdoctoral fellowship at Berkeley and spending two years as an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Now, rather than bore you with a quantitative analysis of Frederick's published work, which is long, let me give you two anchors that define him as a scholar and the contribution for his work. The first anchor is timeliness. Philosophers have been concerned with causation for millennia, as have been children. I didn't break the vase. My sister made me do it. <laughs> Yet in the world that we live in of big data, this question has taken on new relevance. Indeed, naive artificial intelligence picks out correlations, but the consequences of attributing causation to correlation in many social settings can be devastating. It's not just such approaches can offer you better movie selections. They can affect how service providers classify you, and thus the cost of such things as insurance, healthcare, and so forth. Going back to the fundamentals of this problem is urgent. Taking a holistic view is necessary, and that's what philosophers do. And you'll hear about that from Frederick tonight. The second piece, second anchor for Frederick, is that Caltech prides itself on the interdisciplinarity of its faculty and students. We believe that a problem defines the methods that have to be brought together to solve it. But working across disciplines is difficult. There are, at times, very large differences in language and cultures across disciplines that have to be overcome so most of the time, collaboration occurs in relatively related fields, economics and political science, biology and chemistry. Eberhardt is a true interdisciplinary scholar. Within four years of arriving at Caltech, he had developed two important collaborations. One was Pietro Perona in engineering that helped him push his work on causation in large data sets forward. Another with Ralph Adolphs in neuroscience that plums the connections between functional magnetic resonance imaging, and psychometric data sets to ask questions about what is intelligence. At the same time, Frederick continues his own work on the philosophy of causation. All of it is important work. And tonight, he's going to give you a taste of that in his talk on causality from Aristotle to zebrafish. Frederick, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jean Laurent, for this very kind introduction. And I also want to thank all the people who behind the scenes have worked very hard to make this sort of lecture happen. I want to talk to you this evening about causality. It's the kind of topic that I think we're all very familiar with, that we worry about a lot. We care about causes. We worry about effects. Um, we know what the kinds of effects of our actions are, at least some of them we know. And um, yet, when I ask well, can you give me a definition of causation? Can you tell me what it is to stand in a causal relation? It's by no means so obvious what we might say there. And even worse, when I ask, well, what does it take to provide a kind of um, account of how to discover causal effects of a method that we could use in the sciences to figure out causal relations, then we often draw a complete blank there. It seems like causation is not even the kind of thing that uh, when we see it, then we, uh, when we know it, we see, when we see it, then we know it. It seems like the obvious, the, the opposite. That even uh, what we'd like to know is how to see it in the first place. But we do see it when it's wrong. So when I saw this advertising in my neighborhood recently, I thought that maybe this was targeted ad advertising to me. Uh, the causal effects of having a glass of wine are familiar to me. Um, I don't think that's what they were advertising here in particular. Normally, the error goes the other way around. As when I was at a conference last year in Monterey, I was asked to talk about causality. I had prepared a serious talk about causal relations, and uh, the organizers, I guess, thought that the uh, dress code was the topic of the day. Um, maybe it's not surprising that my NSF proposal on the casual analysis fell through that year. 
more seriously, I think we can ask, is causality a scientific uh, concept? Is it something that plays an important role in the sciences? Or is it really just a folk psychological concept, something that we use to describe a certain set of relations to communicate efficiently, but really that when it comes to scientific understanding of what's going on, that uh, causal relations may not play an important role anymore. Well, it turns out that um, one of the uh, perhaps most important, or one of the certainly most uh, famous uh, philosophers of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, had a rather clear view on this. He said that all philosophers of every school imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms or postulates of science, yet oddly enough, in advanced sciences such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never appears. To me, it seems that the reason why physics has ceased to look for causes is that, in fact, there are no such things. The law of causality, I believe, like much of what passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. <laughs> now, it is ironic, especially for someone like Russell, who was a logician to quantify universally over all philosophers and tell you something about the opinions that those philosophers held, yet while he was himself a philosopher who didn't hold those opinions. But that point aside, I think what Russell was getting at was that in the physics of his time, um, causality ultimately wasn't a concept that played any important role anymore. It was taken out and replaced by other concepts that uh, explained what was going on. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, was Russell right? Is it correct that ultimately in our scientific understanding of the world, uh, does causality not play any role anymore? The skepticism that Russell had about causality was shared by another um, great scientist, perhaps one of the uh, three or four greatest statisticians of the 20th century, um, Carl Pearson, who said, beyond such, discarded uh, beyond such discarded fundamentals as matter and force, lies still another fetish amidst, amidst the inscrutable arcana of modern science, namely that category of cause and effect. The motivation for uh, Pearson was somewhat different uh, than Russell's. He um, thought that, well, science is about data and causality cannot be read off from the data. Uh, so as a result, causality has no place in science. I think we've got our work cut out for tonight. Uh, we have to address somehow this type of skepticism. I think actually that this skepticism towards the uh, uh, usage of causality in science um, has led us down a route uh, um, that has really not been very fruitful at all. Instead of talking about causal relations, the notion of cause and effect and the kinds of things that we uh, describe uh, in causal relations has been replaced with other terms. Now, I can see you're all smiling. Just make sure it's sincere when you do it, right? <laughs> um, so I think all of these headlines that admittedly are popular science headlines, but trust me, the underlying scientific papers are no clearer in terms of what sort of commitment to causality they give. All of these headlines are using terms that are imposters for causation. They hint at a causal relation, but they don't actually commit to it. So look at this one, for example, internet use in class leads to lower test scores. The first line says, new research provides a warning to school children who uh, like to use the internet in class, serving the internet in class has been linked to poorer test scores. Well, what is that link? Is that link causal? If so, can we uh, reduce the usage of internet in classes and expect that test results improve? Or is the link of some sort of other kind? I think it matters to us to know uh, wh wh what that link is. And so I think it's very important to get clear on the notion of causality in this regard. A group of people who did know that it mattered and who cared a lot about causality were these four undergrad students from Caltech who came to visit me in my office earlier this year before they were heading to a data science competition in New York. And they thought that among the other things that they wanted to do in preparation for this data science competition was they wanted to figure out how to uh, learn causal relations from the data that they were looking at, and they thought that might give them an edge in the competition. So for quite a while in my office, we discussed questions of confounding, of selection bias, of the difference between experimental and observational data, and how we might infer causal, causal relations from those settings. They went away and won uh, the prize. Uh, uh, was absolutely fantastic to hear that. They did extremely well. And they did so by looking at the causes of malaria and then looking with a, uh, with a, a fixed budget at how one might address the causes of malaria. 
They then came back after the competition and we chatted about their analysis in my office and they jokingly commented on their analysis that they noticed along the way that in their data malaria was linked to uh, mosquito nets. The thought was that in those countries where mosquito nets were used a lot, uh, the prevalence of malaria was a lot higher. Now if we leave it at that linking, then of course you can see what sort of crazy policy decision might come out of that. We want to be clear on what sort of, uh, what the nature of that link is. And I think to these students who won the competition, and perhaps I think also to many of you, the distinction of causation and correlation is absolutely clear. I think one of the distinguishing features of uh, uh, causality is that not only does it provide a basis for prediction, but it provides a basis for prediction under intervention. So let me suggest with a very simple example what I mean. A barometer is an excellent predictor of the weather tomorrow, um, but we of course don't think that the barometer is a cause of the weather tomorrow. We think that something like the atmospheric pressure is the cause of the barometer reading and the atmospheric pressure is the cause perhaps of the weather tomorrow with other things. It's, the barometer reading is not the cause of the weather tomorrow because of course if we intervene uh, flipping the barometer needle to a different place it doesn't improve the weather. Now, for, for the younger ones among you, let me update those slides. <laughs> your phone is an excellent predictor of the weather tomorrow, right? You read the phone, of course your phone is not a, a, a cause of the weather tomorrow. Have you tried intervening on it? It's actually quite funny if you do it, you should try it. Um, but of course the intervention breaks the influence between the uh, weather forecast and the weather tomorrow, and so of course it's not a causal relation there. But it's not as if the weather forecast doesn't have any causal effects. Of course, as a result of what you see on your phone, you might take the umbrella to the beach. If someone hacked your phone and gave you a different weather forecast, then you might take a raincoat instead. So of course, there are causal consequences. And this distinction between just a mere prediction and a prediction that can be sustained under intervention on the system, I think, is one of the crucial features of a causal relation. So um, I think as a scientific concept, Causality is absolutely essential. I think in many domains of research, uh, understanding the causal relations is actually the ultimate goal of the research in the first place. So I think that's true in climate science and neuroscience. I think it's true in many social sciences, even in astrophysics or ecology, where we say that you have understood the system once you can specify the uh, uh, causal relations within your system. And we think that part of this understanding is that we are able to predict what happens under intervention. That's why we care about causation in medicine and education, even think of gene editing in biology. We want to know what the causal relations are because we want to be able to intervene and predict what happens under intervention. There is a third area uh, where I think causal uh, notions are extremely le relevant, and that's I think is that um, our notion of causation underlies our attribution of blame and responsibility. So causality plays an enormously important role in the law and how we assign moral responsibility. And so I think for contemporary technical questions, you can think of like, if we have an AI system that is making decisions about whether you get a loan or not, and we want to ask what is the reason why the system decided one way or another? I think that's where causal notions can play an enormously important role in uh, uh, understanding both uh, fairness and uh, explainability in artificial intelligence systems might be something that ultimately will draw heavily on notions of causal relations. So against uh, what Russell and uh, Pearson suggested, I want to... Um, suggest to you that causality is an enormously important scientific concept. We need to get a grip on it, uh, and we need to be able to develop methods to um, learn causal relations reliably. So if correlation does not imply causation, what then does imply causation? Um, I agree with Carl Pearson to the extent that causality is not just read off from the data, it is inferred from the data. And it's very tempting to say that um, uh, uh, th that what is missing is an experiment. In order to discover causal relations, we have to do an experiment. But I think uh, even there we should be cautious but, because even in experimental data, we do inferences in order to establish the causal relation. Let me give you a simple example. In the 1980s in Tennessee, they ran a study on uh, 
class size. The thought was that small class sizes might, in, in high schools uh, might improve learning outcomes. What they did was they hired a whole bunch of teachers that reduced the class size, and indeed learning outcomes improved. It was a study with a control group, so that it, it was a really quite remarkable study on, on, class, on the effect of class size. The tricky part was they did the same experiment later in California, it didn't work. Um, part of the reason um, of why it's thought not to have worked in California is that it's uh, way larger than Tennessee, and so they had to hire way more teachers. As a result, they couldn't only hire teachers who were as good as the ones that they already had, and not only that, they also didn't have the space to teach the smaller classes. So there wasn't adequate space to provide the kind of classroom environment, nor were there the, uh, the appropriate number of teachers to, um, uh, to do the improved teaching, and so the learning outcomes did not improve improve in California. My point, for my purposes from this, this type of example is that even when you run an experiment, you're making an enormous number of assumptions about what sort of pathways you're activating and which ones you're controlling and which ones you're not controlling in order to draw some kind of causal inference as your conclusion, let alone the general case that in experimental data, of course, you have way smaller sample size normally than you have from observational data. So how then are we going to do causal inference uh, from data? Um, and at this point you might say, hang on, before we go down the route of how we do it, we should first perhaps answer what is it that we're actually after? Can we give a definition of causality? Well, this is where people tend to run to the philosophy department and ask them about uh, uh, definitions of causality, and the philosophers pull the oldest book from their shelf that they have and uh, uh, cite Aristotle on this one. So, of course, people have talked about causality before Aristotle, but Aristotle is in many ways credited with uh, uh, giving the first kind of theory of causality. He defined four types of causes, the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. And to understand what he meant by these causes, um, it's actually useful to think of a statue. So the material cause is supposed to be that out of which the statue is made, namely stone or marble or whatever it is. The formal cause is something like the design or the blueprint of the um, uh, statue. The efficient cause is actually the artisan who carves the statue out of stone. And the final cause is the purpose for which you're making the statue, maybe to commemorate a famous scientist and um, philosopher. Now, if I ask you, OK, we want to get a grip on, uh, on causal inference in the sciences, and we look at this type of definition of cause, then maybe the efficient cause is the one that you pick out and say, here is something close to what we might need. And the efficient cause is defined as the primary source of change. But this is not going to get us off the ground. If I now ask you to articulate, well, what do you mean by the primary source of change? It's going to be, well, you're going to be very hard pressed to give me an account of this sort of thing without uh, resorting again to the notions of cause and effect in the first place. So I don't think this definition is really going to help us as much insight as Aristotle has given us in, in other areas. We might move 2,000 years forward to a different philosopher, David Hume, who also worked on causation, and he offered this type of definition of causation. Yes, 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 the philosophers among you might accuse me of uh, quoting him out of context, but this is close enough. Um, we may define a cause to be an object followed by another, and uh, where all the objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar of the second. If you take this definition on its face value, it doesn't work. And we know it doesn't work. We've already seen it. The barometer precedes, the barometer reading precedes the weather tomorrow. There is a kind of constant conjunction between the barometer reading and what the weather is tomorrow. It's a very reliable constant conjunction. But we established that the barometer reading could not be the cause of the weather tomorrow because when we intervened, it had nothing to do. There was absolutely no effect on the weather tomorrow. So I don't think this sort of definition is going to get us off the ground either. There is a third definition that I briefly want to discuss because I think it captures an enormous number of intuitions that we have about causation, and that is a definition that builds on counterfactuals. That is, causation is supposed to be understood in terms of what would have happened if things had been otherwise. So um, X is defined as a cause of Y just in case if X had occurred, Y would have not have, sorry, if X had occurred, Y would have occurred, and if X had not occurred, Y would not have occurred. So the thought is something like this. If the O-ring on the Challenger hadn't been brittle, then the Challenger disaster wouldn't have happened. I think this sort of notion of causation captures a lot of intuitions we have. It actually underlies all sorts of legal notions uh, of causation, for example, but for causation. But this sort of definition 
upon closer inspection is not going to hold up either. I think one of the simplest and easiest uh, counterexamples to think about in this sort of case um, is the problem of overdetermination. If we have multiple sufficient causes for an effect, then taking away any one of those causes is not going to change the effect. If we take away any, any one of these locks, the door would still be closed, right? But surely what we want to say about any one of these locks holding the door closed is that they are causes of the door being closed. But the counterfactual definition is not going to provide that sort of analysis of the situation. Now, we can tweak and move and uh, uh, have all sorts of maneuvers around this definition, and then the people who uh, dream up the counterexamples can move their counter examples around. What I want to suggest to you is this route of searching for definitions of causality is not a fruitful one. It's not going to give us the kind of thing that we want to have for scientific inference that's going to advance the kinds of insights that we're going to get out of our data. We have to think about causality differently, and the question is how. And to do so, I want to turn back to Euclid, actually, and I want to think about what did he do with geometry. Euclid is famous for having axiomatized planar geometry. What that means is that he offered four, or, sorry, five um, uh, relatively simple assumptions that linked notions of lines and points and uh, um, uh, angles uh, in particular ways. So for example, the first axiom says that between any two points you can draw a straight line. The fourth axiom says that congruent right angle, uh, sorry, all right angles are congruent. What do these assumptions do? They, they give us, uh, they specify relations among lines and points and angles, and on the basis of these relations, we develop a calculus in geometry that allows us to prove things, that allows us to discover new results in geometry, and that uh, allows us to uh, um, develop new theorems in geometry. Moreover, these axioms needn't all be true, right? They build on terms that are left undefined. A line, a point, an angle is never defined in this case. These are primitive terms in these axioms. No further definition is given. Um, you will not be able to work with these axioms un unless you have some kind of prior idea of what these sorts of concepts already are. Now, moreover, we know for the fifth axiom um, that it can be changed. And in general, for axioms, they do not specify absolute truths or um, tautologies or anything like that, but they are very, very plausible assumptions that we think characterize a certain uh, domain of um, inference. So uh, famously, the fifth axiom is, uh, uh, is we can change, we can consider geometries in which uh, parallel lines do intersect or in which non-parallel lines never intersect. And changing the fifth axiom, the parallel postulate in Euclidean geometry, gives us a new framework, a new geometry, a non-Euclidean geometry, but it's still an inference framework for which we can prove things, for which we can discover things, and which is in many ways closely related to Euclidean geometries. In fact, in very precise ways we can describe mathematically. So, why do I bring up all this talk of uh, the axiomatization of geometry? Because I think what Euclid managed to do and others managed to do for other fields of uh, um, inference is provide a calculus that allows us to discover new things. He does not offer definitions. He works with primitive terms that he assumes to be well understood and then describes relations that he thinks uh, are plausible and then mathematicians subsequently have started tweaking those relations and seeing what happens. So I want to suggest let's do the same for causation. What would an axiomatization of causation look like? Now remember, in an axiomatization, we can get away with not giving a definition of what it is to be a cause or what it is to be an effect, but we want to specify relations uh, among uh, causes and effects and the other kinds of concepts that play a role in causation and then see whether we can get a workable calculus to do inference. What might an axiomatization of causation look like? Well, here's one axiom that you might like, is that if x is a cause of y, then y cannot be a cause of x. The thought would be that there's some sort of ordering to cause and effect, and that that's something that we should uh, respect in any type of causal theory that we have. We might also say that if we find that two variables are statistically dependent, then we need to explain that sort of dependence causally. That does not mean that correlation implies, or correlation between x and y implies that x causes y, but it perhaps 
does mean that correlation can tell us something about causation. Maybe that X causes Y, Y causes X, or there is a common cause uh, for both X and Y. Conversely, we might say, if two variables are completely uninformative about each other, maybe we want to say, in that case, there is no causal connection between the variables. Moreover, we might say, if we have a causal system, then to describe what an intervention looks like on a causal system, we might say that, look, an intervention on X, it will break the incoming influences into X, or in this case, from Z to X, but it will otherwise leave the causal system intact. Maybe there are other axioms that we might develop. It turns out all of these assumptions that I've, set, uh, that I've listed here have technical names and uh, have in the causal inference literature been fully mathematized and, and uh, are well understood. And not only that, um, people have worked on tweaking those types of assumptions in ways uh, uh, to discover what sort of effect each one of these axioms or assumptions has on causal inference. All of these assumptions are brought together in a a mathematical framework that is called a causal graphical models framework. It was developed by a group of actually philosophers and computer scientists starting from about the 80s onwards. And in the meantime, all sorts of people in statistics and all over the place have uh, uh, worked on developing this. I don't want to go through the technical details of how this framework works, but I want to give you some of the high-level ideas that uh, um, are manifest in this um, um, mathematical framework. The idea for causal graphical models is that we represent causal relations in terms of these uh, diagrams that have nodes and arrows between them, where the arrows represent direct uh, causal effects between the variables in question. And we associate with each causal graph a probability distribution that is supposed to describe how we generate data of um, that type of causal graph. Now, not only do we want to do that, for causality we have to integrate more. So we want to connect what we see in observational circumstances to what we see in interventional circumstances. So we, the causal graphical model framework formalizes what an intervention looks like and how it manipulates both the causal structure and the kind of data that might be generated from a manipulated causal structure. So I just want to take a tiny little detour for those of you who know some probability theory uh, uh, to uh, highlight one particular thing. In this causal graphical models framework, we want to distinguish between intervening and conditioning statistically. So in particular, take for example, that X, say that X is the level of your gas tank and uh, uh, Y is the um, level of the battery charge in your car, and Z is whether or not your motor starts. Now, suppose I observe that your car doesn't start, the motor doesn't start, but I tell you that your gas tank is full. From that information, you might draw the inference that as a consequence, uh, you might suspect that the battery charge level is low. That's why the car doesn't start. So conditioning on Z, X and Y become dependent. But if I intervene on Z to tweak your car so that it doesn't start, then of course telling you something about the gas tank level will not tell you anything about the level of the battery charge. So intervening on Z, I make the two variables X and Y independent. We have to, for causal inference, be able to distinguish between statistically conditioning and intervening. Uh, that's why we have to extend, extend the probability calculus by this uh, weird operator, the do operator, that represents uh, intervention. OK, you can all wake up again. Uh, that was just for the uh, uh, statisticians. A further, a further uh, um, concept that is very nicely integrated in uh, um, causal graphical models framework is the notion of uh, um, inferences that involve counterfactuals. So we can very naturally compute what would have happened if things had been otherwise. And in some cases, we can specify answers for those sorts of questions, and in other cases, we cannot. But uh, the, the upshot of the causal graphical models framework is I think that it integrates three areas uh, of causation that I think are really central to our notion of causation, and that is what happens to a system when we observe it, how does it change when we intervene, and what would have happened to the system if things had been otherwise. I think that really captures many of the central questions we have about causation. And then the causal graphical models framework provides you the inference tools. Okay, enough theory, let's do something real. This is an animation that I use when I teach outreach classes in high schools uh, in the area here. And the idea is the following. You've got four light bulbs. Each of them is connected to a switch. And you can flip the switch to turn any one of those light bulbs on or off. And uh, the challenge for you is that there are actually wires 
uh, between the light bulbs that you don't see. And you are supposed to discover the wiring diagram between these light bulbs. So in particular, the blue light bulb might be connected to the green uh, light bulb, such that if I flip the switch on the blue light bulb, the green light bulb goes on as well. Right? And so you're allowed to flip the switches uh, in this setting, and you're asked to figure out the wired wiring diagram overall. Now, there is, of course, a, a twist to my story. The wires that you don't see don't work all the time. They only work 80% of the time. <laughs> Have I made the problem harder or easier? It turns out I've made it easier. In fact, it wasn't solvable uh, before I gave you that little twist to it, and I want to show you why. Suppose we flip the switch on the blue lamp first. You see that sort of, you see these three lights coming on. And because you heard me say that it's an indeterministic system, you flip it again. So again, you get the same thing, but you don't, still don't trust me, so well, there you go. It didn't work the same way each time. So maybe then you flip another light switch and you see this sort of data. So already at this point, I might ask you, well, what sort of hypotheses do you have about the causal structure here? Maybe you think, the blue light is a common cause of the other two lights. That at least would be consistent with the data that you saw. Maybe you think that there's a chain of causal effects that's going on here, or maybe you think that uh, it could be both. All of these hypotheses are still live hypotheses, and you might ask yourself, well, how do I distinguish between the two, or a bit between the ones that you saw? Well, notice that in order to establish that there is a diagonal wire from the blue light to the um, green light, you would need to see evidence like this, right? And notice that this sort of evidence would not be consistent with this sort of wiring diagram. But the, if this is the true wiring diagram, if the wires always worked, then you would never see this sort of evidence because the red one would also always be on. So th this is a kind of case where introducing this indeterminism or this noise into the system actually helps us learn something about the causal structure. It turns out students that I do that, this with in the high school classes, they figure out this sort of uh, uh, reasoning very quickly, but they have enormous trouble articulating exactly how they reason to the conclusion. And so discussing those sorts of things, I think, gives uh, enormous insight into how we might discover causal relations. Of course, we can do all sorts of uh, twists, further twists to this type of um, um, set up, and uh, one of them at least that I'd like you to consider this evening is that what if I took away the switches? Could we still learn just from the light patterns that we observe something about the underlying causal structure, and if so, how would we do that? So here it's now worth thinking about how could we automate causal discovery in a way that we could take data and run it through an algorithm and discover something about the underlying causal structure. The high-level picture of these sorts of causal discovery questions that I think is useful is that um, there is an underlying grand truth about the causal relations among a set of variables. We don't see that grand truth, but what we do see are measurements over these variables. We get large data sets, gigantic data sets these days, and what we need to build is an inference algorithm that can take this sort of measurement data and tell us as much as possible about the causal structure. Sometimes we will not be able to uniquely identify the causal structure, but we might be able to reduce the set of candidate uh, uh, causal structures to a small set. Now, there's no free lunch and no free dinner either, so we have to uh, add in some assumptions, and the questions are what sort of assumptions are appropriate? Maybe in certain domains we can use the time order information, maybe in other domains we can't use time order information. Maybe we know that there are no feedback cycles, maybe there are feedback cycles in your domain. The point is we have to be explicit about the kinds of assumptions that we add into our system, and then we want to have provable guarantees about our algorithms, what they can discover under those assumptions from the particular data set about the underlying causal structure. That, I think, is the interesting work to be done to uh, have a, a formal theory of causal discovery. Okay, again, to abstract, so we'll do the real thing right now. Suppose we want to learn the causal structure among three variables, x, y, and z, and we don't know what the causal structure is. So the first thing we might ask is that how many causal structures are there among these three variables? It turns out if we disregard feedback loops, so no cycles in our causal graph, then there are 25 possible causal structures over three variables. They are all here. Um, so these are our candidate hypotheses, but of course we don't know which one is the true one. We don't see what the true causal structure is. What we see is the data. 
we get to do inference from this type of data. And so we can ask ourselves, what sorts of features should we be looking for in this data in order to identify the causal structure? Well, one thing we could do is we could do some statistics on this. So we might find in our data that X and Y are independent of one another, that X and Z are dependent, and that Y and Z are dependent. This sort of uh, statistical inference to independence and dependence statement is something that uh, any first year uh, statistics student should be able to do, at least uh, for simple distributions. So here we've done just a statistical inference and we found various independence and dependence constraints. We can now ask, what do those tell us about the causal structure? Well, consider that X is independent of Y first. In that case, I think these causal structures are no longer candidates because in all these causal structures, X is a cause of Y or Y is a cause of X, but if they are causes of each other, surely they are not independent of one another. They should be informative about one another. So I think that's good reason to exclude these causal structures as candidates. What about the second constraint? X and Z are dependent. Well, maybe you want some explanation for why X and Z is dependent, but these causal graphs don't offer you any explanation. In these causal graphs, X and Z are completely causally disconnected. There's no reason why we should expect any sort of dependence between X and Z if these were the true graphs. So I think we can throw them out. Similarly for Y and Z, if Y and Z are dependent, we want some explanation for the kind of dependence that we are seeing, but these graphs offer no explanation for why, and Z, for why Y and Z should be dependent. In these graphs, Y and Z are completely disconnected. Let's look at this causal structure. In this causal structure, Z is a cause of X and Y. It's a common cause. It's like the atmospheric pressure that is a cause of the barometer and the cause of the uh, weather tomorrow. Well. We know that in that case, the weather and the uh, barometer reading are dependent, but we found in our data that X and Y are independent, so this causal structure has to go. In this case, uh, X is an indirect cause of Y. Uh, in that case, I think we would want to see at least some dependence between X and Y, even if it's an indirect cause of Y. But X and Y were dependent, so this causal structure goes. For exactly the same reasons, the Y to X uh, uh, indirect causal relation goes. We would expect, if this were the true causal structure, uh, for Y and X to be dependent, but we found in our data that Y and X were independent. Now look what we've done. We found the uniquely, uh, 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 we found the unique structure that is consistent with the statistical features that we found in our data. Notice I didn't perform an experiment. I didn't even tell you anything about time order. Yet what I was able to do with the simple reasoning that we could do here on the fly was that I could show you that X is a, must be a cause of Z, Y must be a cause of Z, that X and Y don't cause each other, and Z is a cause of nothing else. We did causal inference from observational data without doing experiments, and we got a uniquely identified causal graph. Now, you might be saying, what did you sneak by us uh, uh, here in, in doing this sort of inference? And I actually was very open about the assumptions I made. I said at the beginning is we're going to exclude feedback cycles. It turns out for the particular inference that I just did for you, I didn't use that assumption, but it is a useful assumption in other cases. I did use the connection that if I saw a probabilistic independence in my data, that I would say there can't be any causal connection between the variables. And I did use the converse of that as well, that if I see a probabilistic dependence, I somehow have to explain that dependence causally. And I also used the assumption that there are no unmeasured common causes. These are all, of course, substantive assumptions that I'm making about my domain. There's no doubt about it. But if I make those assumptions, I can actually prove something about it. I can prove that there are equivalence classes of causal structures that I can identify, and those equivalence classes share features. So any graph in an equivalence class will have the same adjacencies and the same unshielded colliders. Now, what's an unshielded collider? It's exactly this structure. OK, it's getting too formal again. So what does that mean for uh, these 25 graphs? It means that if you give me data and you make those assumptions that I just stated on the previous slide, I will not be able to tell you necessarily uniquely what the true graph is, but I will be able to tell you in what cell of this yellow partition the true graph is. So in some cases, as in the case that we were looking at here, it turns out that the graph is the only one in its cell. And so we were able to uniquely identify it. But in other cases, I might be able only to tell you that the true graph is one of these, but I don't know which. Now note, I made some assumptions and 
uh, uh, I might make different assumptions and then I might be able to identify more precisely what's going on. Or you might say, well, look, you've already massively reduced the number of hypotheses from 25 to 3 or even from 25 to 6. Um, and so we've made enormous advances in identifying the causal structure such that you might be happy and say that, okay, once we've got the equivalence class of causal structures, I might be willing to you know, strengthen my assumptions a bit or run an experiment now to identify which causal structure exactly is the true one. Of course, the example I gave you is an extraordinarily simple one, one that we could do on the fly here over very few variables. And a lot of researchers have worked on developing algorithms for all sorts of settings to do this type of causal inference uh, uh, at scale. And so we now have algorithms that work on time series data that allow for feedback. We can handle unmeasured common causes. We can integrate experimental and observational data. We can integrate background knowledge. And we can really scale this type of inference to massive numbers of variables. What I want to say with this slide is we're in business. We can do this. We, we can, for an, a lot of domains, now really start thinking seriously about doing causal inference uh, from all sorts of different data types. Now, what does causal discovery look like if you've got 100,000 variables? Well, it means that you've got 100,000 light bulbs going off. And you want to discover the causal relations among the 100,000 light bulbs that are there. What you're looking at is the brain of a zebrafish larvae. And what you're seeing are the neurons firing. You're technically not exactly seeing the neurons firing. What you're seeing are the calcium indicators that are attached to the neurons that fluoresce when the neuron is active. So this is remarkable work done by biologists who use light sheet microscopy on zebrafish larvae, which are absolutely tiny, to record the activity of uh, every single neuron in the brain of a larval zebrafish. Zebrafish are um, model organisms. You can think of them like the fruit fly that swims. Uh, they are studied in enormous detail for all sorts of purposes. But one reason why they're studied is that um, in their larval state, they're almost translucent, as you can see on the right there. That means you can see what's going on on the inside. So in particular, if you've got a transgenic zebrafish where you've attached calcium indicators to each of the neurons in the zebrafish brain or in the larval brain, then you can see when the light bulbs go off in the zebrafish or the fluorescence happens in the zebrafish. And so, of course, this is very exciting for someone who does causal discovery because then we can say that, well, can we learn the causal graph over the neurons in the brain of the zebrafish. Is this something that we can get going with? I want to highlight that the kind of measurement that is done for, to obtain this sort of data is really extraordinary. And I would encourage you to Google after this lecture uh, light sheet microscopy and um, uh, calcium imaging. It's fascinating. It should be a whole Watson lecture, but it shouldn't be given by me. Uh, there are people who, who actually know what they're talking about then. On my end, uh, after much data processing and video processing, the data looks like this. Um, here you see a 2D projection of the 100,000 neurons, and you see to some degree the activity that uh, each of those neurons has. And what we are interested then in is can we discover, can we figure out which neuron talks to which other neuron, um, and how would we do so? So if you go back to my high level causal discovery pipeline, the, way, the problem that we're looking at is this one now is that there's some ground truth about the neural connections in the larval zebrafish brain. We get the data over those 100,000 neurons, roughly 100,000 neurons in the larval zebrafish. And then we want to develop a causal inference algorithm for which we, of course, have to make some assumptions. And then we want to see, can we discover the causal graph over the uh, neurons in the larval zebrafish? An undergrad worked with me on this for a year to scale up the causal inference algorithms to a level where we could process this type of data. And then we waited another two and a half weeks for the actual computation on the particular data on one of the supercomputers in the cloud. And what I got back then was this. OK, uh, what are you looking at? You're looking at a 2D projection, again, of about 100,000 neurons and about 250,000 connections that we discovered. 250,000 connections are presumably a vast underestimate of the kind of neural connections that you would expect to see in a zebrafish brain. But this is the kind of, uh, these are the kinds of results that we got. So when I sent this image, which 
uh, the student and I were very excited about two uh, colleagues and collaborators of mine who <coughs> actually study the zebra, <coughs> excuse me, who actually study the zebra fish brain. Uh, they thought I was sending them a Rorschach test. And they were re very reluctant to tell me about anything that they saw in, the, uh, uh, in this image because they thought I might be finding out more about them than I was finding out about the zebra fish. But this is starting, to, this is a fundamental question, is for problems at this scale, how do we now analyze whether we're actually getting something real or not, and how, do we dis, uh, how can we figure out whether uh, um, uh, we're getting a grip on the kind of problem? So we did a lot more data processing on this. This is now a 3D visualization of the neural locations uh, in the zebrafish brain. What you'll see pop up in a moment in white is the graph that we discovered connecting the neurons, at least the connections that we found. And what you see in red is the cerebellum, one part of the zebrafish brain, and in green, the inferior olive, another part of the zebrafish brain. So in order to establish whether we were discovering anything that made any difference or that was in any way correct, we looked at just a subgraph of what we found, namely the connections among the cerebellum and the inferior olive. And here, what you're seeing is basically just those parts of the overall graph and the edges that we found, the connections, these are what we would hypothesize to be direct neural connections between the inferior olive and the uh, cerebellum in the zebrafish brain, turn out to actually be ones that are known from tracer studies and from anatomical studies where biologists carefully tracked down where exactly the neural fibers were going from the inferior olive. So, of course, if you do uh, um, analysis at this type of scale with this amount of data and this number of variables, uh, this might just be a fluke, but actually we were able to discover this sort of uh, uh, connection between the inferior olive and the cerebellum in the zebrafish brain quite reliably, and we were very excited about this because it showed that these this process that we went through of inferring the causal structure was actually giving us stuff back that people who worked on the anatomy of zebrafish brains knew about, and that they knew about these sorts of direct connections. So the overall aim of this sort of work is then to say that, can we use the functional imaging data from the zebrafish brain, discover causal connections that can give us strong hypotheses about what uh, the connection in the uh, zebrafish brain actually looked like, and can they give us hypotheses to focus the attention of people who do the tracer studies of where they might find interesting connections or uh, where they might look for connections that might make a difference to their studies. We're very excited about this, that this actually seems to be working, and I just want to highlight what sort of pipeline of analysis is at work here. So you've got people uh, physicists and biologists doing this incredible work of measuring each individual neuron almost in real time of the neuron firing um, in a tiny little brain, and they're doing that for all the 100,000 neurons that are there. You then have computer scientists who process the video that comes out of this light sheet microscopy to identify the neurons and measure the kind of uh, uh, intensity of the activity that you have in the fluorescence there. The data comes to someone like me, and we do the kind of causal inference to develop the causal graph and give hypotheses there that we can then send back to the um, uh, uh, biologists who work on the anatomy of the zebrafish brain. Um, this is an enormous pipeline, and that we got something that actually worked the whole way through is very exciting. It was so exciting that we thought, okay, what other brains can we look at? Um, in the meantime, in my group, we've looked at all sorts of brains. We looked at human brains. Uh, we've looked at the connectivity in the ganglia of uh, the medicinal uh, leech. Um, we've looked at mouse brains and tried to figure out connectivity there, and we've looked at computer brains as well. Of course, the computer brains, the wiring is, a lot, is, is in fact known, but we thought, uh, can we rediscover the wiring in a microprocessor by just looking at the transistor measurements on the wires, on the, the measurements on the wires of the transistors? Uh, lots of this is uh, ongoing work and uh, too much to talk about this evening. What I do want to talk about is the human data just a little bit because I think it's also one of these enormous collaborative projects uh, that, that, that really can pave the way for uh, um, uh, all sorts of areas um, of inquiry. So the Human Connectome Project is a collaboration between a whole pile of uh, different universities where the, uh, where they studied a large number of uh, healthy adults and scanned their brains and did all sorts of uh, uh, tests with them. 
and made this data available open source. So what's exciting about this is that you've got an incredibly large number of scans. You've actually got an hour of functional magnetic resonance imaging for each person, and they are all uh, scanned under standardized uh, circumstances. So uh, we really have um, a basis to uh, do inference and compare across individuals whether we're getting any kind of reliable output. Now, um, of course, the human brain has a few more than 100,000 neurons. We're looking more like at 100 billion neurons, and um, we can't do the causal inference just yet on that sort of scale. And so you can see there already that we had to aggregate up to much coarser parcellations. Um, as you perhaps know as well, functional magnetic resonance imaging measures the bold signal, the blood oxygenation level in the brain. It measures that at about a resolution of a cubic millimeter, so the starting measurements are at about uh, 50 to 80,000 uh, voxels for the human brain, measured at roughly every second. Um, that's, of course, very slow and then already very coarse. We actually had to coarsen this data up a fair bit more to an anatomical parcellation, as the one shown here on the right, uh, to do our type of causal analysis. And so we're looking at about between 100 and 400 parcels in the brain, and we're interested in the connectivity there. So, of course, we're no longer looking at pure neural connectivity, but we're looking at a kind of mesoscale connectivity in the human brain. To give you just a high-level sense of what that might look like, here is a correlation matrix of what the, uh, uh, how closely each of these 400 parcels in the human brain are correlated. The way to think of this is the following. You line up each of the parcels along this axis, and you line them all up again along this axis, and you ask for each point in this matrix how much does the parcel here correlate with the parcel there. And here we've got all the parcels in the left hemisphere, and here we've got all the parcels in the right hemisphere, and here we've got the subcortical parcels. Because correlation matrices are, sub, uh, are symmetric, we show on the upper triangular matrix the average over 880 subjects that we worked with, and on the bottom, just to give you a sense what the, the matrix would look like for a single subject. As you can see, actually, the data of a single subject is very consistent with the average that we see overall. If we now look at the causal analysis of this sort of data, it looks like this. So the idea now is, to the extent that you've got a dark blue spot somewhere here, it means that we have reason to think that there is some kind of direct causal connection between these parcels. Let me unpack this just a little bit more. If to the extent that you see similar structure in these two triangles, that gives us reason to think that there is a symmetric structure in each of the brain hemispheres. In fact, if you look at, that, uh, at, at those triangles, the um, similarity of the structure in each of these hemispheres is incredible. So uh, if you feel that you've got two people in your brain that are uh, mostly agreeing with each other and only sometimes disagree, then we have some evidence for that. Um, but this sort of analysis allows us now to check very carefully what the differences are in the con connectivity in each of the hemispheres. And those differences might give rise to all sorts of other effects of uh, why certain things are processed in either the left or the right hemisphere. To the extent that you see um, uh, dark, uh, um, a dark line on that diagonal there, that's an indication that we're finding homotopic connections. That is that matching parcels on each side of the brain are directly connected to one another. Now, that will not come as any surprise to a neuroscientist because they know very well that homotopic areas talk to each other through the corpus callosum. What's interesting is that that quadrant up there that indicates the connections between the hemispheres is actually almost completely empty otherwise. That means that we have very, very few diagonal connections connecting, through, uh, uh, connecting the two hemispheres and uh, that if a signal wants to travel from one side of the brain to the other, it seems like it has to go Manhattan distance. We don't have a broad way across the brain. These sorts of studies um, allow us now to look much more carefully at individual differences in the connectivity uh, uh, in, in different subjects. We can look at subpopulations if there are differences. We can look at lesion subjects where we might be interested in how the connectivity is rewired after the lesion. And um, of course, we were also interested in uh, looking across species. So on the left hand, you have the human. On the right hand, you have the mouse. And if you lose, use the scientific tool of squinting, you 
you will see that uh, actually they look remarkably similar. So in fact, the, uh, again, the mouse also in its two hemispheres has very similar structure, and it also seems to have uh, um, these strong homotopic connections between matching parcels in, on each side of, uh, um, in each hemisphere without a diagonal connection going through uh, uh, the brain. Stepping back then, we might think about what sort of thing we can do with all this. And I really think it's the neuroscientists who have to give you some detail about all the types of questions that we can start asking with um, uh, the, the, the sort, this sort of toolbox that we can use now to analyze uh, neuroscientific data. I am, after all, not a neuroscientist. What I've given you here are examples of applications of causal inference in neuroscience. But what I want to suggest to you is one step removed further back, is that I think we now are in a position to automatically identify causes and effects and the relevant pathways of causal influence across many, many scientific domains. We can really now get our hands dirty and do the causal inference uh, um, if, if someone's willing to share the data. And in many cases, we can now try to resolve the ambiguous terminology and tell you which of these links between variables are actually causal and which ones are just mere correlations and which ones are just uh, casual. And um, moreover, I think we can systematically study a system observationally and in many cases make predictions what will happen uh, uh, when the system is subject to an intervention. And that can be the brain, that can be an economy, that can be all sorts of other things that we might want to apply these sorts of methods to. But um, uh, perhaps one further step is to say that we have a decent grip on causation now. With this sort of grip, we might be able to ask more advanced questions and say that, well, can we talk about moral responsibility now and mathematize that in a way that it can be useful for automated systems and that we can ask for those systems to be fair and what it would take to prove that such a system is fair? Or if you want an explanation from your automated decision system, what would it take to provide such, a, um, uh, uh, such an explanation? And I think in all those cases, these types of causal inference methods are going to be extremely relevant. At the beginning, I was introduced as a professor of philosophy, and by this point, you might have your doubts about whether I qualify still. Uh, you might be wondering, where did all the philosophy go? And um, I, I uh, want to emphasize just in the last uh, couple of slides that I think a lot of this is actually philosophy but in a particular way of looking at it. So often philosophers are credited with clarifying concepts. For example, like causation today, we can, we can um, uh, give different ways of thinking about it. Uh, I think that's true. I think that's a valuable thing that philosophers do. Um, but I don't think that's all, and it shouldn't be all. I think with this type of approach that I've presented to you today, we can really ask better questions about the fundamental assumptions underlying scientific inferences, and with an understanding of the fundamental assumptions, we can start developing better discovery methods. We can really uh, start offering provable guarantees to identify things that previously were dirty words in the sciences. We can start talking about causality again. And, but in order to do this, uh, to have this type of injection of ideas and of new frameworks into the sciences, we philosophers have to be integrated and we have to collaborate with the scientists there. We have to get our hands dirty in the data. We have to bang our heads against the inference that's not working and figure out what's going on. This is not something we can do from our armchair in our office. We have to be there in the lab, uh, otherwise it's not going to work. So on that note, I respectfully disagree with one of the uh, heroes of uh, Caltech who said that philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. <laughs> Um, I think this is a very unfortunate quote. It might be due to what Feynman read or what philosophy of science was like at the time. I'd like to uh, actually side with Tim Maudlin, who's a, a philosopher of science, who responded, it always surprises me that no one points out that ornithology would indeed be of great use to birds if they could ask the ornithologists for advice and if they could understand it. Um, I think what Tim Maudlin is after is what he wants to say is that, look, <laughs> 
We want to reflect on the kind of inference system that we're using in our domain. We want to figure out new ideas and understanding those uh, uh, um, fundamental assumptions that we're using. It might be useful to talk to someone who has uh, some experience in studying fundamental assumptions. I have to say, I'm extremely pleased to say that actually there are an enormous number of people at Caltech who are willing to talk to an ornithologist. Um, I have been privileged to uh, work with uh, many, many people here on campus who have opened their labs, who were uh, sharing their data, who want to uh, get the input on how to do causal discovery, and uh, who uh, we have argued about concepts and how to do things correctly in their domains and publish together and uh, um, uh, try to advance the fields, both in philosophy and, uh, and in their scientific domains. But while colleagues and postdocs and so on are all fabulous, what I really want to highlight are the undergrads uh, who I've worked with. Um, I work with a whole group of undergrads um, almost all the time. And for this talk in particular, I want to highlight the work of Ethan Pronovost and RJ Antonello. Uh, RJ spent the year uh, battling the zebrafish data and battling the code and uh, really um, working all of this out until one day he emailed me this picture that I just uh, showed you of the Rorschach test. Um, and Ethan Antonello, uh, sorry, Ethan Pronovost um, uh, worked through all the human connectome data and has really uh, made enormous advances there. These students are absolutely fabulous. They do things that I wouldn't have been able to do without them, and I've been absolutely privileged to work with them. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>